So what does every hockey fan in the Maritimes over the age of 40 have in common? Well, it's not a team. It's not a region. It's not a uh, food that you enjoy playing, eating at games or a, a pro uh, squad or a fanatical devotion to a certain hockey card set. It's, we all have one thing. A John Brophy story. Have you ever heard about a John Brophy story? Now, for the five people out there who have never heard who John Brophy is, let me fit you fit you in or fill you in, as we say. Fit you in would be good too. In the history of Nova Scotia, this guy is is more than a legend. He represented the Anaganish uh, Nova Scotia on the hockey map for, for so many years. We don't even know when it started, and we really the only reason why it ended. He passed away five years ago. Now. Born John Duncan Bro Brophy, January 20th, 1933, in Antigonish, one of the most beautiful communities in all of Canada, was a Canadian ice hockey coach and hockey player who spent most of his career in minor professional leagues as a player and a coach, including 18 seasons as a skater in the Eastern Hockey League and 13 seasons as a coach in the East Coast Hockey League. From 1686 to 88, the native of Antigonish was head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs of the National Hockey League and also spent some time prior to that as head coach of the Baby Bulls, the Birmingham Bulls of the EHL. Now, Brophy was a tough defenseman, again, who played 18 seasons in the Eastern Hockey League, racking up nearly 4,000 career penalty minutes between 55 and 73, the most in EHL history, playing parts of nine seasons with the Long Island Ducks and retiring at the age of 40. Now, if you look at the rough stats, he first came to major prominence for a lot of people in the Nova Scotia system playing with teams like the Halifax St. Mary's of the MSHL. Now, he graduated to the Milwaukee Admirals of the IHL, then the Troy Uncle CSM Trojans of the EHL in that 53 season. Played with the Moncton Flyers of the NBSHL in 54, then the Moncton Hawks of the AC Senior League. Uh, at the time, 5'11", solid 175. Uh, Denny's EHL journey uh, began, ladies and gentlemen. Baltimore Clippers, Charlotte Rebels, 56. The Clippers, 57-58. Charlotte New Haven, 59. Charlotte Clippers again in 1960. New Haven Blades in 61. The Ducks in 62. The Philadelphia Ramblers in 63. Philadelphia LI in 64. Then the Ducks between 65 and 69. New Haven, New Haven Blades again, 69 season in 1970, back to the Ducks in 71, then Long Island, uh, Jersey in 72, then the Jersey Devils to wrap up his career in 1973. But uh, the penalty minute numbers are just through the roof, ladies and gentlemen, for consecutive seasons with the different teams, uh, 212, 225, 132, 141, 190, 290, 281, 140, 325, 241, 236, 224, uh, 152, uh, 264, 215, 178, 162, and uh, with the Jersey Devils, 220. And uh, longest run in the playoffs, I think uh, like 61 with New Haven, 15 games, 3 points, but put up a lot of penalty numbers. Now, when he shifted over to coaching, uh, it was uh, retiring at the age of uh, 40. He knew he was going to... Uh, 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 do something after after a hockey retirement. Now he spent time. Get this, uh, had a part as a referee in a Schaefer beer commercial, which aired for about five years on various New York television uh, channels. Now. He had briefly been player coach with the Ducks in the 69 season and became a full-time coach following his retirement as a player. Now he coached uh, the Hampton Gulls for four seasons until the team folded during the 78 campaign. The, uh, he then joined the Birmingham Bulls of the WHA as an assistant to Glenn Somnor, becoming head coach in 79 when Somnor joined the Minnesota North Stars. His team did finish last in the league, but included several initial stars at beginning their professional careers, including Ricky Vibe, Michel Goulet, Rob Ramage, Craig Harris, and Gaston Jingra, as well as Team Canada 72 hero, a 36-year-old Paul Henderson. Now for the 79 season, even though his team was the only one in the league not to make the playoffs, he was awarded the Robert Schmertz Memorial Trophy as the WHA's Coach of the Year.
After the collapse of the WHA, Birmingham moved to Central Hockey League and Brophy coached the team for another two seasons. In 81, Brophy was hired by the Montreal Canadiens to return home to coach their AHL affiliate Nova Scotia Voyageurs and held a job for three seasons in dramatic fashion because the team he coached then, every possible prospect with Montreal was in the system. Now, after the successful tenure with Nova Scotia, he joined the Toronto Maple Leafs organization, first as an AC with the Buds, then briefly as head coach of the Leafs AHL farm team, the St. Catherine Saints, and then as head coach for the 87 season. The Leafs showed, uh, showed some promise during Brophy's first season as a coach, despite finishing the year with a losing record, but it all went downhill from there with an embarrassing season in 88. However, the Norris division was so weak that year that the Leafs actually made the playoffs, despite having the second worst record in the league. He feuded constantly with general manager Jerry McNamara, who tried to have Brophy fired, but ended up being fired himself. After an equally poor start to the 89th season, and despite being a favor of Leafs owner Harold Ballard and every Maritimer that was following the Leafs, Brophy was eventually fired uh, in December of 88, 33 games into the season. Now, from then you he knew he was going to land his feet. He found a home in Norfolk, Virginia with the Hampton Roads Admirals of the East Coast Hockey League. He coached that squad for 11 seasons from 89 to 2000, winning the league title in 91, 92, and 98. The Admirals, of course, did not have a losing season with Brophy behind the bench. Now, some controversy, of course, after a game in January 99, a fight broke out in the ice and fans were throwing, of all things, batteries. Brophy was accused of assaulting two security guards in the melee, but the guards said they were, trying to keep him away from the Ronicky fans. In the end, Brophy pled, pled guilty, fined a thousand dollars, and suspended for six games. Now, June 25, 2000, Brophy was badly injured in a car accident near New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. He was listed in critical condition with a broken leg and a head injury, but uh, Brophy survived uh, mainly because he had fallen asleep at the wheel while driving and woke up in time to survive the crash. Now, after his successful recuperation, he returned to the ECHL in 2001 as coach of the Wheeling Nailers for two seasons and then, then retired. The ECHL's Coach of the Year Award was renamed the John Brophy Award in 2003. As of 2006, he's the all-time leader among ECHL coaches in regular season wins with 480, playoff games with 94, and playoff wins with 55. And it was inducted in the ECHL Hall of Fame in 2009. Now, he gave back also to Nova Scotia. In 2005, he coached his hometown junior team, the Anagua Ganesh Bulldogs of the Maritime Junior A Hockey League. And for 2007, at age 73, he went back to Virginia as head coach of the Richmond Renegades of the Southern Professional Hockey League. According to statistics provided by the NHL overall, as a pro hockey coach, he accumulated 1,027 victories, the second highest amount in all of professional hockey, behind only the great Scotty Bowman. Now the question is, will he make the Hockey Hall of Fame down the road? Hard to tell because uh, some of the media don't like him, but some of the media basically believe a minor hockey coach with only limited NHL success and WHA success shouldn't be in a Hockey Hall of Fame. I personally think he should get in, at least in the Canadian or uh, related Halls of Fame, no doubt. But I let let the the, uh, the people like Lanny McDonald's group decide more than me. Now, after one season with the Richmond Renegades, it was announced that Brophy would be released from his contract. His emplacement in Richmond was former team captain, Brian Goody. Uh, and of course, uh, Brophy, after a long illness, died in his sleep in Aganish on the morning of May 23rd, 2016, from a long illness and uh, at the ripe old age of 83. Now, with Birmingham in 1979, 32, 42, and 6, 6 in the WHA. Uh, with Toronto in 87, 32, 42, and 6, 70 points, for the Norris. Bet St. Louis first round, but lost like a division finals to Detroit in the quarterfinals. In 1988, lost in the division semifinals to Detroit, and was eventually fired after 11-20 and two record in 89. So uh, NHL totals, uh, disparaging, but you know that's what it is. 64, 111, and 18, mainly due to that 21, 49, and 10 record where Toronto did make the playoffs that year. 
and uh, nine and ten in the playoffs. WHA total 32, 42, and six. So um, John Brophy's career easily can be brought down to, to this. He he won two titles with Hampton, 91, 92, and 98. He didn't have enough of uh, team had players in Nova Scotia to make a run like they did in the 70s, but the the WHA years helped him develop some of the best players of the NHL of the 1980s. And uh, many players have said without Bro- Brophy's guidance, he wouldn't have done it. But you got to look at this in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. He was co- he was playing in the late 40s, early 50s, and really wrapped up his coaching career in the late 2000s. So if you put in a uh, Really 60 years, 60 or 70 years towards hockey. you got to be good. And every person has a John Brophy story, whether a coaching decision or a battle with the refs or interaction with the fans or basically, you know, that shock of white hair. You Like he stood out literally and figuratively. You know, um, one of the toughest coaches I've ever heard of, but he, he treated everybody the same, like Vince Lombardi. You can't, like I said, you can't have the results he had. Let me put this in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. It's over a thousand wins, eh? Okay, but uh, look at Long Island in '74. Won 34 games, five games. Lost in the finals of the NHL. Lost in the finals of uh, SHL with 76. Um, uh, Birmingham uh, was a was a great effort. You look at the good year, the good year in Toronto. That he, you know, kind of partially rebuilt the team. Those great years in Hampton, even with Wheeling, uh, the first season he played, he coached in Wheeling, they were over 500, didn't make the playoffs. And like I said, consistently, imagine for anybody to win a thousand games as a coach, you need to do that for 40 years or get 30 wins for 33 consecutive years. You'll never see this again. So besides him and Scotty Bowman, who else is there? Who else is going to win over a thousand games in the modern NHL? Because over time, uh, over time, and you know, coaches don't last any more than I don't know, uh, five, ten years now. Maybe, uh, maybe twelve, thirteen in the minors, yes, but not, not to the consistency of the different teams that John had coached. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening. But if anybody wants to read up a John Brophy, there's various publications, articles, a myriad of, of newspaper clippings and books that refer to him. But I do remember, like I said, when he made the playoffs, when he only had. 21 victories, and when he won the game against Detroit, and the announcer said, well, the Brophy magic. Well, John Brophy was magic because he was our own. He was our maritimer, and anybody that was a coach coming up had to basically say, you know, I can make it because John Brophy made it. What's the odds of somebody from a small community of Anaganish, second only to Scotty Bowman ever for all-time victories for a pro hockey coach? That doesn't happen every day. And these were good teams. These were hometown hero teams. And Birmingham, my God, coaching all those great players. I mean, that's they could have went to the Olympics and won the gold medal in 1980. No joke. If they had an under-23 team, they probably would have won the Olympics. Anyway, so thanks for listening. Have a great evening, and watch the heat. Bye.